awesome that we've got people from all over South Korea and all sorts of places. So Australia as well, I saw, and uh, even Essex. <laughs> I'd like to really thank everyone that's joined this because this can be quite a difficult conversation. Now, the reason I wanted to do this webinar, or we wanted to do this webinar because everything we do is about improving people's lives. And, you know, I, I, I've clearly loved a drink in my time, but um, it got to a point where it had to stop and I didn't see the purpose of it anymore. So, that is the reason for this webinar tonight and um just hoping that you know you might not have an issue um you might not you might have an issue and might be telling yourself you don't have an issue uh which i did um or you might just be sitting there thinking well how would my life be different if i didn't have the drinking in my life how would it improve because let me tell you regardless of who you are whether you're an accountant a personal trainer, whatever you are, whatever you do for a living and how much, you, regardless of how much you drink, reducing greatly or, or stopping, which is my advice, will greatly improve whoever and wherever you are in life. So the way we're going to do this tonight, and we like to do our webinars with both of us involved. So um, I think it's really important for Laura to be on this chat as well, because although a lot of the the the, the really sort of when I say the bad stories yeah they are quite bad I suppose um you know a lot of that history wasn't around Laura it's only when I came back to the UK and decided I didn't want you know I knew I had a problem I knew I knew I had to get a grip on it and I, I said to myself right I want the next girlfriend I meet it will not be in a bar and uh yeah, every girlfriend prior to Laura, who's now obviously now my wife, um, I met in a bar. And with that came inherent issues. Um, but there you go. So anyway, it's it's interesting for Laura because Laura really helped me through that, that journey. Um, so, um, yeah, it's important we've got here. So Laura's sort of going to ask questions. Um, obviously, uh, we're not going to take too much of your time. Uh, but Laura's going to ask ask questions, and then um, yeah, we'll take it from there. So yeah, shall we? Without further ado, listen, we we have got a load of questions that got emailed in, so look, we will keep an eye on the chat. But um, if we don't get to your question, um, please don't be offended. But um, we also will have a copy or a recording of the chat, so we will go through that afterwards. So anyway, without further ado, um, I just want to start off with some stats before that happens. It's gone already. Um, was I supposed to kill a bit of time? No, you weren't supposed to kill a bit of time. I'm just going to see how many people we've got on there, actually. 132. 132. Right, that's awesome. It's just, it was interesting to, uh, when we did our first webinar in December. We had over a thousand people register for that. And for this one, we had over 500, which is a great number regardless. However, it's interesting um clearly no one's got a problem or clearly it's a conversation that people don't want to have which tells me it's even more important that we keep having these conversations we keep sharing our stories and our journeys and hope hopefully inspiring inspiring others to take action or make changes and I think one thing I just want to say is, is we're not being judgmental in any way whatsoever to anyone's situation whether they drink whether they don't drink that's not what we're about we're about um sharing Ollie's story like I'm the one at the end of the emails at the end of the day I'm the one that sees the messages coming in countless messages saying they've read Ollie's book um it's inspired them to make a change how much their life has turned around so I know that Ollie's message is so strong and it has already um impacted a lot of people and has the potential to impact a hell of a lot more which is why we're doing what we're doing and why we're here tonight Go on then, Statman. Statman. I always think it's good to bring in some some stats. Um, so it's not just about my point of view, but the, the stats are quite alarming. So for, let me just go through this. Between 2006 and 2019, the alcohol-specific mortality rate in England remained roughly constant, fluctuating between a high of 11.3 deaths per 100,000 population in 2008 and a low of 10 deaths per 100,000 population in 2012. However... In 2020, alcohol-specific mortality rates increased 19% from the previous year to 13 deaths per 100,000 population, the highest rate since this data has been made available. 
24% of adults in England and Scotland regularly drink over the chief medical officer's low risk guidelines and 27% of drinkers in Great Britain, Britain binge drink on their heaviest drinking days. I can certainly relate to that, which is over eight units for men and over six units for women. That's not a binge. Go ask you how to drink. It's a light night. <laughs> In 2017, 20% of the population reported not drinking at all, and overall consumption has fallen by around 16% since 2004. But the mortality is going up. Mm. And the UK data shows that 2020, there were 8,974 alcohol-specific deaths, which is around 14 per 100,000 people. This is 18.6% increase in deaths from 2019. Alcohol misuse is the biggest risk factor for death, ill health and disability among 14, uh, 15 to 49 year olds in the UK and the fifth biggest risk factor across all ages. From 2009 to 2019, the price of alcohol decreased by 5% relative to retail prices and became 13% more affordable than in 2008. Alcohol is 74% more affordable than it was in 1987. Now, listen, they're the stats of, of drinking and stuff like that. They're the stats of, you know, mortality and people that are dying through drinking too much. But it doesn't mention about the, the, the people that are just causing absolute misery throughout their whole lives. It doesn't go into the people that are causing themselves mental health issues through the amount they're drinking. And a lot of the time people will say, well, it's not the drink. It's not the drink. And, you know, it's not a problem and this, that and the other. So anyway, I hope this uh, session um, helps you in, in whatever respect, you know, regardless of how much you're drinking, it might make you think a little bit differently. Uh, but as far as I'm concerned, you know, I went, I went for my run this morning. And I thought I am the, the fittest I have ever been in my life and when I say the fittest I've ever been in my life yeah of course I was faster when I was younger um etc cetera, etc cetera. but the thing is all round as an all-round perspective of health and and fitness I am the fittest I've ever been and that means my mind is the fittest it's ever been um so anyway um let's start off with the questions because it wasn't all ways that good <laughs> although it seemed at the time so we're going to go back right back you know to my introduction to uh to alcohol yeah let's um let's have a little uh a quiz let's see if everyone's awake at the back um just type in the comments can anyone does anyone know whereabouts in the uk ollie's from i'm just gonna have a quick look oh there could be prizes yeah <laughs> there's not don't get too excited let's have a look anyone know where Ollie's from? Oh, yep. England. England. Yep, hone it in a bit. Derbyshire, we're getting close. Shropshire, Shropshire, we live there Stafford's now. It's warm. Burn on trend. trend. Well done, Sue. Sue. So Burn on Trent. Cost. And what is Burton on Trent? This is the next question. What's Burton on Trent famous for? Do we know anyone? What is Burton on Trent famous for? Carling beer. beer. It's yes. a brewery town. Yeah, well, everyone got that. Have a great day. Go and smash it. It's going to be a block. Oh. <laughs> um, yeah, it is famous for beer. It's got loads of breweries, hasn't it? Because yeah. of the River Trent running through it. Um, yeah. Mainly. So you were born and grew up in Burton-on-Trent. Now, yeah. your family uh, were very connected with breweries. I mm. know your mum used to work for the brewery. Yeah, um, your, pretty much my whole family, yeah. Yeah, your auntie had a long career there, and in fact, your cousin still works there, doesn't she? Mm. So, um, very big connection there. And I remember this really funny story that your mum <laughs> your mum sometimes gets out around the, the table. Um, if, if ever anything comes in about Ollie's drinking, um, there's always this story that comes out that your mum likes to tell about how appalled you used to be about alcohol when you were a kid. Now, I can't remember exactly what age you were, but there's this one time she said she was out on a on a works do one night and she came back and she was so drunk and she sort of fell out the taxi and she was crawling up the driveway and she she couldn't make it to the door could she so, so she was banging on no, the she, couldn't, she couldn't get in the door she couldn't get in the well, door couldn't so she came around to the side because she knew there was sort of french windows or you know what what are they called yeah the, um, the french, yeah, french doors so french doors she's, that, she's yes. banging on the window trying to get you to let her in and you in your moment of disgust as like 13 14 maybe just shut the curtains on her no no it wasn't just that I was in I was actually in the room in my house and I was looking out with my mates and I knew she was trying to get the front door I knew she was absolutely bladdered and I was like I'm not letting her in 
because I knew she just couldn't, she was so that junk, drunk she couldn't get in the door. So <laughs> anyway, she crawled around on this in this lovely green dress. She'd just come from a from the brewery piss up and she came crawling round. And I was in this room with my mates. And I saw her come round and she looked like a proper mess. And all she wanted was help. Just let me in. Just I didn't, you know, she needs to get into a sanctuary just to just to die inside. And I can remember sat there and she came crawling around. And I went to my mate, how would you like to have a, a drunk for a mother? <laughs> and she came up, she was just about to come through the door with, with one hand pushing through the French doors. I slammed the French doors shut and I pulled the curtains across. Oh, oh. <laughs> oh what, a, what a contradiction. Yeah, so what went wrong? Let's, what went let's wrong? go right back to the beginning. Where did it all start? Like when? Yeah, well, it was some years after that. And it was, um, you know, again, my family got paid. There was always beer around the house. There was always, you know, my sister always used to come out with, with diamond white. I don't know if did you ever, yeah, diamond white. She used to bring cases of it home and every Friday she'd be on it going out and everything and then I did the same with her same treat, treatment with my sister I was like it's, you're disgusting you, you know drinking alcohol this that and the other but then you get to that stage don't you in life and unless you actually have some kind of I don't know something that 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 you know like I do know people so mad into their like Ross Minter for instance mm, yeah. you know he's never drank in his life because he was so dedicated to his fitness but it, unless you've got something like that then you are going to go down the track of, of drinking my best mate uh mark sheriff me and him i can remember our first sort of drinking it was like just grabbing everything from in the house like bailey's what's that gr yellow thing that creamy oh, stuff, Abacar. Abacar, Abacar, that stuff everything yeah. just in a bottle just mix it all in and then go to the school disco and oh it's just it's, it's horrendous so that that was the start of it really and you know once you've had a taste of it you know you there's peer pressure as well from everyone else because you think it's tough it's hard and everyone you know and then you just start on that journey don't you so from the age of 14 I really start you know I started drinking you know and that um that was the start of it mm. yeah so you know typical teenage behavior then basically yeah just and um which listen I don't you know at the end of the day that's part of growing up yeah. isn't it I think everyone has to experience that well don't have to experience it but you know it's everyone's right to experience that um and learn through their own yeah. um you know by their own judgment whether it's good or bad yeah so. but you know you were into your fitness you were training hard you were very good at sports yeah at school and obviously you had your desire to get into the, the marines yeah and um you know I think when you're that age you, you don't suffer hangovers do you and you just crack on with it yeah I mean at, the, at that age you, you like you, you know it's not like I'm, I'm going to drink every night you know you, you wait to the next yeah. party or yeah, whatever exactly. and, you know so it's, it's you know you don't you do it once every now and then yeah so let's skip forward to the marines joining mm. the royal marines age 18 um let's just dive now about the into the drinking culture in the military let's just have a chat about that because obviously mm. yeah, I know a bit about it but just just like just talk to everyone else yeah I mean it. listen there's you know a massive part of military culture as everyone pretty much knows is drinking you know it's how you really bond with with your, your team people around you and it's just the the old adage that you know we work hard we play hard so you know we worked hard and we, we we played double hard so but that taught me a different level of drinking and the games and the things that we did and the nakedness and in public and it was just I've never I mean, yeah uh, you know, I've, I think, I've never I mean you've seen what it's like when military people yeah, get together yeah and it's it's um it's a different level of shock tactic going on. Yeah, it's just, it's just, just trying to outdo each other. Yeah, outdo everything. each other in yeah. shock to, you know, and some of the stories and it's just, it's funny. It is, you know, we had some amazing funny times, but yeah, it's pretty brutal. Mm. It's pretty brutal. But it's that, you know, you work hard, you play hard, you know, you used to go away working, you used to come back and you used to go on binges. You know, and I, that's one thing I like to say, you know, not, I, I've read a lot into this. Not everyone is the same. Like some people will go and have a drink and then the last thing they could do the next day, I mean, you're probably like that or we're like that, yeah. is have another drink. Yeah. And genetically, some people are different. And I was one of those different people. And these are the people that have got to be really careful. And that's the people that the next day you sit there and then you can go out mm -hmm. and like you just want to keep on that high or it's the fact that you don't want to 
uh, go into the harshness of that cold turkey and that depression and everything else, you just keep on going. And that was very much me. So it was a very much a binge drinking culture. Mm. You know, the majority of people binge drink. But it's almost encouraged, isn't it? It's almost encouraged. Yeah. And, and this is, you know, where clearly the military, I don't know what it's like now. I mean, you've been out a long time, but, mm. you know, there's, there's questions to be spoken about around how we manage mental health and stuff like that in those yeah. kind of institutions. But it's it's very much um, encouraged as a as a yeah. wind down, isn't it? And certainly in your day yeah. and age, it would have been. And also the fact it's like when you used to go away, do stuff, you know, instead of coming back, there's a different systems and policies in place now. But, you know, when you used to talk about emotion, you... Any kind of emotion was weakness. And mm. you were told just to shut the fuck up and have a beer mm. and get on with it. Yeah. Um, and that was the way of coping. That was the coping mechanism. So. Um, so let's move from the Royal Marines to the smooth operator of the SBS. How did the drinking change? <laughs> it didn't change. <laughs> it didn't change. It was a massive part. I can remember actually when I was on my selection, I actually, <laughs> before I did special forces selection, I actually got a five grand loan out so that and i got a five grand loan out no, i don't even know this no you don't i've just i've just I've thought, great. Look, i got a five grand loan out so that all the time on selection when i had time off i had no excuse but to go out and party so that like money was never going to be an issue you know i had that five grand loan so that whenever we had time off i had no excuse but to go out right yeah, yeah. so that was a good idea. <laughs> That's a great idea. But anyway, in the SBS, it was it was the same again. You know, you, know, you worked harder, you played harder, mm. and um, you know, again, a massive part of, of Royal Marines and SBS is is just drinking. Yeah, you know, it's, it's 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 that constant drinking. But you know, at the end of the day, you have got the tight fitting suit of the SBS to keep you in check. Mm. You know, you have job a job to do. You have something that you know you just can't be drinking all the time. You know, so. This is why I refer to a lot, you know, my, the safest I ever was in life because it kept me from myself was when I was in the special forces, when I was in the military. You know, the real, um, the real dangerous times, if you want to call it, that was either side of being in the military. Mm. So, yeah. So let's move on to that then. So let's, you know, so you, you've got this drinking culture that that, that is happening all the time it's just part of life in the military and then how did that then escalate when you left what, what well I'll tell you what, I should tell you a story about in the SBS because it's quite it's quite monumental actually um now every year we used to go to um we used to go to Norway and we used to um do Arctic warfare training out in Norway in the SBS you did in the Marines and you did in the SBS it was obviously a lot different in the SBS, you had a lot bigger toys to play with and assets and everything else. It was amazing. Um, and I can remember we, we went down to the south of Norway because we, we were going on the diving package. So obviously a big part of the SBS is diving. And, um, you know, it's basically diving under the ice and getting, you know, using the SDV, the, the swimmer delivery vehicle and doing all kinds of drills in the freezing cold. And so anyway, we went on our way down there and I can remember can't remember quite what year it was but I know it was like it was we got down there on Valentine's evening and I got down there and I was like to the lads I was like right lads come on everyone was squaring the kit away and I was like lads come on let's let's go out and everyone I couldn't believe it there wasn't any takers I was the only taker I was like lads what are you doing and I was like lads it's February the 14th your wives are probably back home going out with someone else you may as well come get out <laughs> get out on the last of me i was using every trick in the book to try to convince them that they must come out with me anyway some of the support lads came out with me and i was the only sort of sbs operator that went out we went to the local town and it was a massive thing that the sbs had turned up you know it was all in the papers you know the elrics the fast boats that we had the, the sdvs and it was like the biggest thing that had happened in that little town since since the war you know, so it's all over the papers. There was a lot of exposure anyway. Covert then. <laughs> no need to be covert in Norway, <laughs> is there? Um, so anyway, went to this local bar. As soon as we went to the local bar, as soon as we walked in, it was like, it was like uh, bees to honey. Top gun bar. Yeah, so, it was. Yeah. It was just ridiculous. It was like, you know, so you, you pulled straight away. Anyway, early start the next day, eight, eight o'clock in the morning. So anyway, cut a long story short, I can remember waking up in someone's apartment 
this girl's apartment and I went, looked at my watch and it was like 10 past eight. And I was like, oh my God, I can't believe it. You know, the diving package started at eight o'clock that morning, which is probably 45 minutes the other way. And I just thought, you know what? If I'm in trouble, I may as well be in big trouble. So I just lay down on the bed and just thought nothing of it. Anyway, next thing there was knock, knock, knock on the door. And this girl gets up, goes to the apartment door, opens the door, comes running back in. She says, it's your friends from the, from the, from the military. And I was like, how the hell, how do they know that I'm here? I just couldn't work it out. So anyway, I went to the door and it was two of the lads and were like, Ollie, you are in this shit big time. And I went, how, how do you know I'm here? So anyway, what had happened is because I was missing, they ended, up, they ended up calling the police. And anyway, they called the police and anyway, they went to the bar and everything. They managed to get the CCTV footage of me going off with this, um, with this girl. And they knew exactly where she lived. It's such a small town. So they knew exactly where the apartment was and everything. Anyway, I then got back there. They took me back and I was got a major, 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 major bollocking. It was like, I was just like, I can't believe it. Good start to the dive package. Anyway, what my sergeant major did say to me, he says, look, I'm not going to, when we go back up north to the HQ where everyone was, we're not going to take this up there. We're not going to just, you've had your bollocking and that's it. So anyway, everything was sort of swept under the carpet. Anyway, we get back up to, after the diving package. We get up to the um, to the HQ place, and we're all sat there having dinner, and everyone's there. And um, next thing, and I'm thinking, you know, I'm just having my my dinner, and all the HQ, you know, all the sergeants and all the sergeant majors, everything are on the table. And then this, I can I can remember seeing the LO came walking in, which is the lia liaison officer. The local is a Norwegian army guy, liaison officer. He's got a paper under his arm, newspaper. And he walks in and I can hear this. I'm so close to it. I can hear it happening. And um, they, they say hello to him. He, said, uh, he says, uh, I see you have been in the newspapers again. And I just thought nothing of it. I'm eating away. Um, and he, he starts reading out this article. And it says, last night, a Royal Marine um, frogman operator went missing in the mountains. Helicopters were scrambled, you know, and all this, that, and the other. This was in the local paper. Helicopters were scrambled, and men were searching for this uh, for this man all night. And then at the end, he said he was later found tucked up in bed with a Norwegian hair with hairdress. <laughs> Believe it! I spat my food out all over the table. The place just roared into laughter. And in the in the end, it was actually that funny that I got away with it. But mm. that was just like one of the stories, and. I don't know how through my career, you know, I was always the one that would get in the shit and come out smelling the roses. I don't know how I did it. I really don't know how. That was just one story of many stories. But the thing is, you know, I was good at my job. That was the thing. I could swim good. I could shoot straight, which helps. Um, but I was it. just a bit of a hand grenade, you know, and it was just all the drinking. It was like making. Say again. Decision making on drinking. That's yeah, yeah, decision. exactly. And it was just, you know, when I, when I look back now, I mean, look, I have definitely no regrets. But the thing is, I almost feel like I've ruined that experience. I didn't get the best out of that experience because the, the main dominant drive in my life was drinking. It was just like it, and it, did, it didn't then seem like a problem. Mm. You know, to me, I could justify drinking, you know, so I worked hard enough. I was doing this, doing a hard job. So it was OK and it was kind of accepted. But, you know, when I looked around me, even the people that I was with, um, you know, I was drinking more than them. You know, I was, it was, it was, it was just a major drive in my life. Mm. So, yeah. And what about when you came out? Yeah. When I came out, that's when things got really loose. Um, and you know, there wasn't the tight fitting wetsuit of the SBS to keep me in check anymore. And I can remember coming out actually when I first left and it's like, obviously you used to work hard, play hard. And when I first came out, I didn't really have a lot to do. Mm. So a lot of those, I was, I was playing hard all the time. You know, as the met you like, I can remember in, in the week going off, getting a bottle of gin and, you know, gin and tonics all night. And, you know, it's just, it was just mayhem. Um, and that went on and it was, I was drinking a lot more and I wasn't doing any exercise really when I left. Um, yeah, and I was just like struggling through life. But, you know, I was just instead of facing my issues, facing my problems, I was just drinking, you know, because as soon as any kind of confusion, any kind of questions about what I was doing came up, the best thing to do was just have a drink and just numb. It was it was the numbness that I needed just to keep on going every day. 
Yeah. Um, so it, yeah, it got worse. And then really it's uh, that led me, you know, three years of like trying to not do things that were military. And then I got pulled back into, to, into going back to, to war, which was basically back to Iraq, um, which was good, but then it was probably the most hazardous part yeah. of my career. I was going to say, date. because I mean, you know, you've spoken about it being like the wild west when you were out there and it was at that time. 2003 2004 and and literally you were you had no protection in the military you were a target your life was at risk on a regular basis so and that's when probably things got worse with the alcohol wasn't mm. it would you say that but i mean can you can you pinpoint a, when the dependency started or no no i mean then, then i was still thinking i just thought it was just part of everyday life yeah you know, at the end you of the day with the lads in that yeah back with the lads in that kind of you work hard play hard everyone was drinking in iraq yeah. um, and again but i was in that villa and i feel i was drinking more than everyone else you know it, it was it was a massive again it was a massive part of drinking but you know was that we were out in a war zone we weren't in the green zone we were out in the red zone with the iraqis you know which was very really mm. dangerous we we're doing loads of pro iraqi contracts but I can remember, and I talk about this in the book, you know, it's yeah. like I went to, we went to, when you, on a Thursday night, Thursday was your Friday, uh, because you had the, the Friday is their holiday. And I can remember every, every Friday, Thursday, it was a massive party, someone else's villa somewhere across the city or something. And if you're going to go to someone else's villa, you got tooled up, you're in your cars, you got there, you know, you, you took, you, you took, you went there with your body armor, your weapons, everything. Um, and I can remember I got to this place and absolutely getting leathered you know whiskey and everything and just absolutely and i don't know what i don't know what made me think this was okay to do this but i just decided to leave on my own middle of the night i had no id on me no nothing i just grabbed my ak-47 i grabbed my body armor and i went out and got got to my car and i let got them to open the gates and i went and I was straight into the city of Baghdad in the middle of the night. It was just crazy. Drunk. Drunk, absolutely steaming mm. drunk. And I was that drunk, I couldn't remember. I, couldn't, I didn't know where I was. Mm. I had no idea where I was in the city. And I started to shit myself. I was like, oh, my God. Because if the Americans found me, I had no ID, no nothing. So that would have, you know, could have caused major. If, if the militia found me, they don't need to tell you what would have happened there. So well, you, you did lose a mate out there, didn't you? As well? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Through. Yeah, a lot of that was because of drinking and socialising and stuff. Um, so I remember I drove that car to the highest point I got. I could. I got there was a bridge and an overpass. I thought I'll get it to the top of there just so I can have a look and see where I am in this city. I didn't realise quite how drunk I was at that stage, but I stopped on the top and I opened the door. I fell out the car and my AK-47 followed me and fell on top of me. And I think that was a massive wake up call for me because I just thought you, this if you get home tonight, you really need to rethink. Mm. I did manage to make it home again, smelling of roses. But, mm. you know, that for me was like getting there, being attacked fairly regularly. And it was horrible because you got attacked and we were in a massive gunfight with, with the militia on the highway. I didn't think I was coming back from there. So I lived every day like it was its last, you know, and when we weren't working, we were drinking. And then when we finished drinking and everyone went to bed, I can't. I carried on drinking. You know, I used to be there in my room in the in the villa. I had a pistol under my a nine millimeter Glock under my pillow. And I was just waiting for, you know, every night I just thought it's going to happen tonight. Mm. You know, I just drank until I knocked myself out and hoped that I might wake up in the morning. Yeah. And then taking Valium on top of that to handle the anxiety the next day. It was mm. just like it was it was a path of destruction, you know, alcohol dependency dependency on valium or addiction and then being shot at on a regular basis in a war zone living in a war zone you know, imagine my head was absolutely fried mm. scrambled mm. but you left there and you went back to australia mm. and you you were aware that you did start to have a bit of a problem with it at that point because you were trying to get a normal life again yeah you? you were trying to trying yeah. to establish some kind of normality which is ridiculous mm. for you but you were and you'd started to get that awareness to your drinking. So yeah, I mean, aware that it was becoming a pro, it was yeah. a problem. Aware that it was a problem. I was starting to look at the patterns of the past. You know, I was starting. To, I was mature. You know, how old was I then? Wow, I was 
late thirties, yeah. mid to late thirties. Yeah, but, yeah, forty. But 40 I mean, up, but you know, it's like you know, you. I remember you telling me a story about you going to an AA meeting at one point. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And and actually not feeling like you had a problem. Yeah, I went to the AA meeting. I, you know, and I went and shared my story. Yeah. And after I heard everyone else's story, it was like pathetic. Yeah. <laughs> So you didn't go back. You know, so I didn't go back. And I, you know, but, you know, I realised it was a massive problem. I, I started to question what I was doing. I started to see the patterns of the past behind me, the, the, the cloud of confusion and the cloud of mayhem behind me. I started to ask myself, is this, you know, I, I knew it was wrong, but I couldn't stop. I just mm -hmm. couldn't stop. And then even, you know, I then ended up going out to um, Southeast Asia rescue, you know, well, the best thing I ever did, rescuing the kids from child prostitution and slavery all that um, human trafficking stuff, anti-human trafficking stuff. And I was still on operations, you know, we we were still getting, you know, we're still drinking every day, mm -hmm. you know. And then coming back from there, because that fell down overnight, you know, it's we had to escape out of Thailand. We had to make our way, you know, come back to Australia. And that is when it crashed. That's mm -hmm. when it massively crashed. And I was in the, I, I didn't know where to turn. And I was starting to think about, suicide and like i said to everyone you know it's i don't know if i'd ever i never attempted it but the fact i was there it was a wake-up call for me and for the first time in my life i started to i took responsibility mm. you know and i stopped blaming the outside world for this that and the other and you know i took real responsibility for where i was and said this can't go on you know a voice in my head said ollie it doesn't end like this you know not in not in suicide and I realized from that point that I had to turn my negatives into my goals. You know, from that moment on, it was about starting to think about who I wanted to be. Mm. You know, and it wasn't where I was right now. And the more I say this all the time, but the more we focus on anything, the bigger it becomes. So the more we focus on what we hate, you know, I hate the amount I'm drinking. I hate this. I hate that. The more the bigger that will become. It's You have to look at it a very different way. And that is about who you want to be what that looks like and once you've got that you add emotion to that what does it feel like to be that person and that was the slow climb from that dark and gloomy place that I was and it was slow but it was it was positive mm. but it was still you still were a long way off actually quitting at that point mm. weren't you I mean because like before you left Australia you had kind of got it together and you got out of a sort of well yeah. on the surface you yeah. had Right. You'd got out of a destructive relationship. You got yourself a decent job, a mm, decent yeah. apartment. Um, you were training hard. Yeah. But you you kind of created this living for the weekend type mm. of scenario because you were trying to control your drinking. You hadn't given up by any means. Yeah. But your way of controlling it was to just limit it to the weekends. Mm. But then the weekends turned into massive enders, didn't they? Yeah. Friday, well, even sometimes Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. So you were kind of cramming everything you yeah, missed in and the then, weekends. And then I'd not turn know. up to work on a Monday. It was just like, it was horrible. It was really horrible. So, um, yeah, it was, it was still, you know, I recognised it was a massive issue. I got my first ever sort of nine to five, jo nine to five job. And, you know, you have to be accountable. Uh, or you're held accountable, aren't you? Mm. So... You know, and that that was just that was just mayhem trying to manage that. And really, I, I was just working to pay for my social life. Mm. You know, I'd always been working to pay for my social life. I just thought, you you know, just try and get at least a half cool job. But every, but your focus has to be going out and getting smashed all the time. I don't. That was my mentality. It wasn't about building a career and this that, and the other. And that started to change. Mm. You know, I, I realized I couldn't keep on doing this anymore. Mm. You know, I just start to see myself in the, in a few years' time, still drinking, still drinking, and 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 the thought of that scared the hell out of me because mm. I still had I had nothing. I had a decent, really good job. I had an apartment which I rented overlooking the Brisbane River. It would look good from the outside, but I was it was still I was I was still suffering on the inside. Yeah. So you came back to the UK. Um, most people know the story from here. No, um, I don't no, think they I do really, though, because but... I came back and I was still drinking. I could, yeah, I can remember drink, actually. Yeah. I came back and I had a surveillance job initially, which yeah. was good. But the thing is, it was paying decent money, and when it was paying me decent money, it was taking me away from my real passion and desire to start Breakpoint. Mm -hmm. And it was at the point I was like, when I when I threw in the towel on that, and I was still drinking heavily. I can remember driving back from London, 
extremely stupid. And I'd, I'd got three cans of beer in the car. Mm. You know, in the van, I, had a, I can't even remember what vehicle it was, but I was drinking on the way back, you know, from, from London. You know, I was coming back to, to Cornwall to lock myself into a house yeah. to change who I was because I couldn't handle it anymore. I couldn't handle being me. I hated me. Um, and I had to change that. You know, I can remember waking up the next day and thinking, what a, an idiot. If I'd have been stopped, if I'd have caused an accident, blah, 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 whatever. So at that point, I was like, right, this has got to stop. But then I was in that house. You know, mm. I was in the house for three months where I was changing the blueprint of who I was. And again, I just denied to myself that I could ever stop drinking. Just that message saying, you know, that, you know, I, I heard my mates talking. I heard my ego. It was, it was your ego, but you, this thousand person audience around you saying you'll never stop. Mm. And I was thinking, in my, how could I ever replace what I'd been working on for all of my life? And that was really drinking was such a massive part of who I was. It was my identity. You know, and it was yeah. almost like people didn't know me unless I was drunk. You know, I felt I didn't have the confidence. It was renting a personality. So, you know, it's, it was it was something that I had to stop. But my mind said you can never stop. And I was I was just going through the torture of trying to manage it and not, you know, get oh, I can't wait till Thursday. I can't wait till Thursday. I can have a drink then. And it's all right. I deserve it now. I deserve it now. Or even if I've pushed it till Friday, managed to get to Friday. And then just hammer it mm. because I deserved it. I'm a, it's a stupid place to be because really all that happened then is by the time Monday came, it took me till Wednesday to really recover. I was back on point by Thursday and back drinking by Friday. So much of my life was being sucked away. I lost my creativity. I lost my productivity. I wasn't getting anything done. Nothing was getting done. And I even felt, you know, at that point, it was getting to the point where even when I had one or two drinks, it was still having the same effect. Once I had one or two drinks, I was just like, oh, I can't be bothered. Mm -hmm. I can't then, be bothered with it. I had no willpower, I had no willpower, no nothing, no drive. Mm -hmm. And it was just like, you are never going to get anywhere. No. And then there was benders again, weren't they? Because that was at the point that we were, we just kind of got together. And yeah. I mean, I remember in the early days, you go, oh yeah, you going off on vendors and not mm. coming home for a few days you know and, and again that was it, it was it was every yeah. time you would meet up with the lads foxy you know back in that kind of environment it was like that just seemed to be the mo didn't it yeah it was it was and it was easy easy for me to fall back into so easy and it got to that point and I, I knew between me and you you know i could see how it was affecting you and i knew that if i knew that those three people in the relationship was not going to work and when I say three people, there was the drinking me, the me, and Laura. And I just mm. thought this is not going to work. And you know, you know, you could see that as well. And mm. it was affecting you, it was affecting us. And it was just, it was, it was mate, it was, it was that decision. Mm. Uh, but it got to the point when I filmed SAS Who Dares Win series one. I can remember the night before me, Aunt Foxy and Billy went, uh, well, no, it wasn't Billy then, it was it was Colin. Colin. We went out, we got absolutely hammered the day before we were going into filming. And then that night we had to sleep on the base and the base is haunted. <laughs> yeah. And we were, we were twitching anyway, like some kind of addicts. <laughs> and we had to sleep in this hangar. It was creaking. It, it, apparently someone had told us, the guy, the security guard, this, oh, it's mega haunted. And all night it was horrible. It was like the, the devil came in to see us all that night. <laughs> Uh, it was horrible. And then the next day, first day of filming, it was just tragic. And that really affected my whole performance that I felt throughout the whole of uh, first day, first series. Mm. So when it came back 2016 to do the next one, again, my mind had been telling me, no, you can never give up. It's part of your life. It's such a massive part of your life. You can never give up. And I remember saying to myself, right, I need to be the best I can be for this next series. I was so disappointed with myself for series one I was like series two I'm going to do everything I can in my power so I've got nothing else to blame but me well it was an opportunity as well yeah. right so yeah. and this is where I think you know you can kind of bring it into having having something that is bigger than you in order to pull you out of it because mm. let's um because obviously we are on to the point of like what made you stop now and um you've covered some stuff there it's you know I hope it's not been too heavy but I don't know how you can bring much lightness into this one but um 
maybe we'll try and make it a bit more positive around the stopping and that now but um yeah you know like when that first series of um SAS Who Dares Wins came around it was obviously a pilot wasn't it mm. like most things they do on TV no one was expecting the level of support for that show it, it was literally it was you know we just thought wow isn't this amazing it could be it's a one, be one, off. one hit wonder and then it'd be gone you know make hay while the sun shines kind of thing and obviously we'd started a business off of the back of that you know we've got we've got Breakpoint up and running and we'd done our first course and then we you know we're starting to get more courses and more interest booked in for the next year mm. And then obviously series two did come about because there was like it was the, the feedback was awesome from series one. You guys all know because that's why you're here. And, um, you know, they commissioned another show straight away, didn't they? And mm. and immediately at that point, it was like, oh, my God, there is an opportunity here. There is an opportunity to be on TV again, to build more something. And I think it, it was at that point, wasn't it, that, mm. that there suddenly became something that yeah yeah so basically people. yeah no it came to it came to that 2000 the second one and i was like mm. right i'm going to give it the best shot so i'm going to stop drinking up until we finish the filming and then i'll be back on it it was eight weeks wasn't it you gave yeah, eight, it weeks, eight given, weeks and it was the long that's the longest i've ever stopped drinking for longest ever since i was since 14 years old well no not from 14 years old that was you know there's the, you know but certainly from when i really started drinking around 16 it was the longest since about 16 um and I, I love filming you know while we're filming there's a lot of opportunity while you are filming to drink but there was the odd nights and the lads were going out drinking and stuff like that and I was managing to hold back it was tough in the jungle that was wasn't it yeah that was in Ecuador mm -hmm. and then um it got to the end and Foxy was like come on mate let's let's get on it and I can remember that's if it's the first time ever instead of going into that habitual habit of just going yeah come on let's get on it I took that breath and I took the breath and I breathed and I went, I weighed up my options and thought about it. And I went, no, Foxy, I'm not doing it. And that was really the first time ever. And he was like, what? I said, I've got so much clarity up here. I feel so good. I just don't want to. And that was the start of me stopping drinking, mm. you know, and that would then go on for two and a half years. And it was absolute bliss. You know, initially, can I just ask, what was that first eight weeks like? Because I can't really remember that time that well. You know, like oh, I, I was just, filming. No, when you that, you know, because it was like January. I can tell you exactly when it happened because it was. What bit are you talking about? When that before that eight weeks before. Yeah, we but that was including filming. the film, so I was away for yeah. a lot of that. Yeah, time. okay. So, but I remember because it was when you had, um, you had gone. We were talking about this earlier. You'd gone. Foxy was off to row the Atlantic. Mm. so he was out of the equation you'd gone off on his party to like before they went away yeah. to row and then um and then it was when you came back from that that you were like right I'm going to stop so can you just tell people like like what what did you do what were the coping mechanisms in mechanisms that you use like well it's, it's like I made a, I'm, I, I said to myself I'm going to stop eight weeks yeah. out so you know that was it I got into my training everything else and I just got off the drink for eight yeah. weeks so anyway, I got off that. And then after that, it was like, you know, when I first started, it was like, it was like tough because it's that got to that Friday and it's like, Jesus, what do I do? I was itching. I was itching on that Friday night. It was like, I couldn't get my head around it. What do I do? And it's amazing because initially you think, what do I do? What, what am I going to do? Because you then, then, but then you start to realize, Jesus, how much of this is stealing my life? And then all of a sudden you start, you know, we start, we'd started our business mm. so I can remember us on a Friday night we were starting to do stuff yeah yeah we were just working, we were working. Yeah. I was like thinking if I had, was drinking this wouldn't be happening and we're mm. working on our business on a Friday night it was like it felt so good mm. but that that was that was amazing to be able to do that mm. you know but and all of a sudden like once you stop it's like a massive gap but then you start filling it with with positive things mm. and before you know it you then say how did I have time to drink? Mm. You know, it's, it works the other ways, but you've got to step into that short-term discomfort for long-term gain. So anyway, coming away from that, you know, that was two and a half years, mm. wasn't it? Yeah. Two and a half years and then... But the, I think you'd got so much momentum mm. and you were so proud of that decision that you yeah. made when you came back from filming. It was just like game on, wasn't it? Yeah. It was like, there was but no... Feel, the feeling was just... Amazing. It's that feeling, like, I can always remember a mate of mine saying to me how do we get that feeling back from when you were young where you used to get out of bed and feel so alive and, and so so excited about the day 
And it was like getting that back. It was like getting my life back. When I stopped drinking, it was like that. Mm. the first time it was like getting my life it was my, getting my life back it's not to feel really energized amazing and and have that spring in my step and have so the clarity up here mm. was just incredible yeah. so yeah it was yeah the best the yeah. best ever but there was a relapse there was a relapse <gasps> dun 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 it's yeah not over yet yeah and so. that was you know it's like and uh, listen i'm so glad that i did this because it really confirmed everything for me. And that was when we went out filming in Chile and we had a, we filled two, two series back to back. We had about three days off in the middle. Yeah. First, and I was first like, celebrity one. Was yeah, it? it was, it was the first celebrity one. It was like, there was a lot of hard stories in that, that uh, interrogation room. Yeah. There's a lot of stuff going on and we're absorbing this stuff. And it was like, it was easy for me to reach for a drink and justify it. Mm. And there was also that thing in my head saying, well, you've done two and a half years. You can control it now. Maybe you can have a good relationship with it. Mm. So anyway, that three days I, I had drank for the first time in two and a half years. The headache the next day was disgusting. It was yeah. like my first time drinking ever. Um, and that started me on again, an eight, yeah. eight month journey of drinking, yeah. you know, saying, oh, you can control it now. This is good. Justifying it in my in my head. And that got to the point where I got to, we went up to Scotland to film, not, not film, on a recce for SAS Who Dares Wins up in Isle of Skye. And I drank all week with the lads, me and Billy especially. Um, and you'd gone away to Norway. Yeah. And I came back to, to, to the house on my own and we drank at the airport, got absolutely smashed, me and Billy did. And then got here. Saturday morning, I woke up. And my head was like, ah, you know what? I've had a really tough week. Um, I deserve some time off. I deserve just to chill out. Murphy was there, the dog. And um, 10 o'clock in the morning, I came into my lounge. I can remember. I lay on the sofa and I turned the TV on. Started watching the TV. And then all of a sudden, a voice in my head said, what the fuck are you doing? What are you doing? And then I went and said in my head again, I think I actually spoke to myself and said, if you weren't drinking, you'd be out on the hills now. You'd be doing something. You'd be out enjoying life. But look at you. Look at the state of you. And that's the last time then that I had a drink. I said, no, that is it. It's gone. And I really had to go, I really had to, to go back there to, to really confirm that it, it was the right thing to do to give him drinking. Yeah. And that was the last time I ever drove, drank. And I have to say, you know, this is sort of going on now, you know, for me, you know, I've talked about this before, but when something has consumed your life as much as drink, you know, and I've talked about the purpose pyramid, it's a pyramid, it's, it's been in my book in battle already, you know, three questions, top of the pyramid is, do, do I enjoy it? The answer is always going to be yes in the short term, but the bigger picture, no. Of course you don't, you know, it's like the headaches, the loss of, loss of your days, the following days. So no, the answer is no to that. Does it add value? That's the second question on the purpose pyramid. No, of course not. No growth, no value, no nothing. And then the third question, does it help others? No, absolutely not. It certainly wasn't helping anyone around me. So that for me was like, I've got the subject matter of alcohol, three questions, all with a cross on. Why is it in my life? And I think really, you know, when I when I look at drinking, what happened to me, what changed me? I started to question everything in my life, you know, especially something that was consuming so much. And really, I want everyone to ask yourself that. If you're really starting to think about what value is, is drinking my life, then good. Because if you're asking those questions, you've made the first step to your biggest and, and widest stride you'll ever make. Because really, you know, ask yourself that question and write things down. Like, why am I? Why? Why do I drink? What is the point of it? How is it helping me? You know, if drink was was one of your mates, <laughs> you'd have told them to jog on a long time ago. Mm. You know, so yeah. So so really, for me, it's like you've really got to start questioning what's the point of it. And the only people that can sit there and tell you that it's the best thing you could ever do is the people that have done it, mm. you know, because everyone else will tell you, oh, I don't, I've got a problem. If you can't go out and 
go out and not have a drink, if you've got to have a drink, then you, you're dependent on it. You're absolutely dependent on it. You know, there's no, there's no two ways about it. You know, and if you want to start your own business, you wanted to start doing something in life, you want to focus on your health, on your well-being, on your mental health, the best thing you can ever do is just stop. It's just not offering offering any value whatsoever. Mm. Um, I just want to touch, um, we've done nearly an hour already. <laughs> oh. So I think we should probably wind it up soon, but I want to just touch on a couple of things before mm. we do. Um, I just want to touch on, uh, interestingly enough, the title of that book, All or Nothing, because, you know, I think there are people like I didn't have a problem with alcohol for instance I gave up to support you mm. um and I could I always had a very much a take it or leave it approach with alcohol yeah um I would go out and get drunk of course mm. but then I I would I would not want to look at another drink for at least another week you know before yeah. I even thought about it again so my relationship with it was very different to yours but um I think, and this is the thing that the relapsed proved to you is that you have an absolute all or nothing relationship with it. Like, and and I don't get me wrong because there are, you know, and I've seen we've had some emails from people saying that you know they've they've stopped for a long time and they've got it back under control and they have got a great relationship with it and and amazing. Like, if you are the kind of person that can just and and I was one of these people, you know, go out, have a glass of a nice glass of wine with a meal or a glass of champagne at a wedding and just leave it there. Like amazing. However, <laughs> you really weren't, were you? And right. and I think like you didn't know that you like you had to kind of almost do that relapse, didn't you? Yeah. To prove to yourself that there was no middle ground mm -hmm. with you. And and there is no middle ground with anything in life with you, is there? Like <laughs> no. Um, it, you are really in yeah, all I'm an extremist. Person, I'm an extremist. Yeah. But the thing is, you know, really, I want to start pointing people towards the damage that it does. It's an actual toxin. Yeah. And it's totally water soluble alcohol. Alcohol is so it's going into each and every cell of your body, trillions and trillions of cells, and it goes into those right into the cell. And the damage it causes up here is is incredible. I mean, I've, I've listened to a lot of podcasts. Um, the Huberman podcast, especially, which has got a great one. We're gonna, I'll, I'll put that out on a link to everyone on this. So um, just, just the amount of damage that it's doing to you. Mm -hmm. and, and really, you know, my whole thing in life is to live a longer and happier life. Yeah. I can remember saying once or seeing a comment once on Instagram where I was talking about when I first gave in, gave up and remember someone said, you only live once. Yeah. And I was like, exactly. So why would I want to abuse it in such a way that I don't remember it? Yeah um so you know it's, it's it's just knowing that there's a better way mm. there's a better way and yeah i just hope that's sorry that's why i'm going on i have to take my supplement <laughs> yeah so um yeah no it so, was, yeah just, no the damage it's doing and the, yeah. you know the, it's it's quite you know so it's it's the best thing i ever did to stop drinking yeah and we did yeah they have better relationships, better life and better future, better everything. Yeah. And it's freedom. It is absolute yeah. freedom. You know, there's no none of that. How we're going to get there? Who's going to drive? Da, 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 all that kind of rubbish. You wake up on the, in the mornings and, you know, I, I love going to these events. Sometimes we don't go out a lot. And, and, you know, that's the thing. A lot of people say, well, what about what am I going to do when I go out? Well, once you stop drinking, you'll you'll find more things of of greater value in life mm. and one of those won't, won't really having having to go to the pub every 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 weekend so you know at the end of the day if your mind is telling you you can't give up and you want to give up all you've got to do is take the first step forward and give it eight weeks or whatever it is and start to understand how much freedom that's going to give you and how great you'll feel feel about yourself yeah Right, I think we've got time's getting on. I'm conscious of that. I don't want to keep everyone. So have we got a few questions? We have got a few questions, but I'm just wondering if we should just wrap it up now on the hour and then I can easily email yeah. people back with the questions just because, you know. Yes, yeah, so do that. Listen, we, lives we will. And, um, we, have we got loads of questions? Yeah, but like, you know, we could do a part two of this because there's yeah. so much more to go into. and Because uh, oh, we're flying out to Australia. No, I, I mean, like next month. <laughs> 
Like there's like there's a lot that you. I'm going snowboard. We're going snowboarding tomorrow. You are. I'm going snowboarding. Laura's not going. She Laura's writing her memoirs behind a horse-drawn sledge. Maybe not. No, she's not. I'm going to. Yeah. But yeah, Laura's unfortunately got to watch me snowboarding when she, uh, she lost a snowboard as well. Mm -hmm. But she fell off one of my motorbikes, which is I'm still getting blamed for. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. So anyway, we're off yeah. to Austria. And um, yeah, but we will get to your questions and yeah. stuff. Um, listen, all I will say is I'm not going to I'm not going to make a big thing of this. If you do want to give up, it's going to take a lot of time and dedication for you to do that. Okay, you probably had a very consuming habit that has dominated a lot of your life. It's not going to be as easy as you making an, a, an emotional decision that I want to stop. Mm -hmm. it, it takes so much more than that. Now, this is the point as well that we do have something for you. We do have um, a course that you can join where we can really make you accountable to 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 give in. OK, and or to take some time out to to understand the benefits of doing so. If you don't like that, switch off now. Mm -hmm. um, but at the end of the day, the course that we do is extremely cheap for what it is. But we're of the mindset when people pay, they pay attention. Um, so everyone is going to get a link for a five week course called Project You. So if you want to really kick in the habit and really work with the subconscious, which is where we have to work to stop these habits please follow that link that we send out to you and join that course. It's mm. amazingly powerful. It's exactly what I did to kick in the drink and change my life. But thank you everyone for your time. I know it's a sensitive mm. uh, a topic and um, you know, it's, it's relative to each and every one of us. So um, it's only you that can make that decision, but let me tell you, I am, feel so strongly about it. And I see a lot of people around me that, you know, say they haven't got a drink problem, but most of their time is spent drinking. Um, and not enjoying life and not getting the most out of life. Uh, it's about making the most out of every moment. So uh, there you go. Mm. Have a great evening. Thank you so much for your time. Thank and you. we'll see you again for the next webinar. Thank you.